Welcome back to the show, everybody. We'll check out these headlines we got for you. MicroStrategy in El Salvador. Things are not good, ladies and gentlemen. We've talked about this. We're going to talk about it today. Ripple New Headquarters. We got to talk about that. SEC attacked and called out from the inside. One of their own, ladies and gentlemen. SEC versus Ripple updates. You're going to want them. We got a couple of them for you. And what does it do to the case timeline? Somebody roll that beautiful intro and we'll find out. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Dig Perspectives at the top of the screen. Everything that we're talking about here today. And give us a follow on Facebook, too. Digital Perspectives News or Digital Perspectives No Spaces on TikTok. Oh, we got highlight reels on TikTok, ladies and gentlemen. Digital Perspectives No Spaces. Check them out. They're rolling in as we speak. $1.851 trillion market cap for crypto. We're up 1.3% this morning. It is May 4th. 2022. Good morning. I love to smell a crypto in the morning. Yeah, Bitcoin 38,900, Ethereum 2,800 plus right now. And at the number six spot, it's 61 cents for XRP right now. Let's take a look at the range of price. The range of price right now ranging between 60 cents on the bottom, almost 63 cents on the top. We'll keep an eye on as we move. Oh my God. Take a look at this. Link 2's done it again. This has to be too good to be true. Incredible. Don't mess around. Register today. If you haven't made your first investment on Link2.com for private equity, like Ripple, Uphold, Link2 itself, BitPay, and so many other great ones, you better do it today because they're giving you $1,000 of XRP and dropping it into your account. Come on in. How about that one? Yeah. So to celebrate, Link2 is offering $1,000 for your first time Ripple investment, not a excited about a Ripple investment? Make any non-Ripple investment and receive $500 worth of XRP for your first investment on Link2. Link underneath the video, ladies and gentlemen. Take a look at this because this is getting... I tell you, you know, and, and, and no slight to Michael Saylor, he has been in an investment world for a long time, especially in the fintech blockchain space, birth of the internet. The guy has been around a long time. I, I know this will sound bad, and I do not say this to try to um, make him look bad. But if you remember, we covered quite some time ago that Michael Saylor had also lost in the dot-com bubble and was one of the biggest losers when that bubble busted. And here we see, hopefully history is not repeating itself, but we have talked about this. MicroStrategy shares plunge after missing earnings by 794.67%, one of the largest misses in history. The company also faces digital asset impairment losses of $170 million from Bitcoin. And here we go to build on that. El Salvador's Bitcoin bonds haven't worked and some fear default. We already know that, you know, as legal tender, it's not working down there. We saw that. I covered it from CNBC. Reporter went down there right in front of our eyes. Two to eight hours for transactions. They didn't buy the two things, couldn't buy the two things they wanted and ended up getting hit with a purchase and a double spend. Before they got out of there. It's a mess. But this isn't. This is Ripple's new headquarters in San Francisco. I did a side-by-side. -side. Building one is new headquarters for San Francisco for Ripple. Building two on the right is the Denver, Colorado Federal Reserve. Now, listen, there's a similarity there. You know, there's a similarity I see, and I did that for fun. But then I say... And from day one, Ripple has been stacked with U.S. Treasury officials, including the 43rd U.S. Treasurer, Rosie Rios. Can you say systemically important? Any questions? Here's another thing I'd like to add to this. Ripple's got a new headquarters in San Francisco. They didn't leave, ladies and gentlemen. So I think they're feeling good about the outcome of this case. And don't forget, they don't have to give up the escrow that they are the steward of. Not I'm not talking about the, escrow, the what Ripple holds. That's a different amount. I'm talking about the escrow that is released every month. They don't have to give it up to the government if they become a part of the government or a systemically important part 
of the government now do they they just have to be held to a heightened potential of supervision hello u.s treasury <laughs> read this brief going over the sec's beefed up crypto enforcement yesterday we covered that the sec doubled its size of enforcement for crypto assets in the cyber unit yikes is the word and it does sound ominous i like what jungle inc says here about it and we're going to go over exactly what it is very quickly here he says, it seems like giving clear guidance to multi-billion dollar enterprises that are begging to follow the rule of law would be much easier. Warren Davidson, why are they allowed to spend tax, tax dollars like this? That's such a great question. And I tell you, maybe Warren Davidson holds Ethereum. Maybe he could answer that publicly for us. That would be nice. Or family member. I don't know. Do you, Warren? It would be nice to know. SEC doubles the size of enforcement. We're going to take a look at this really quickly. It is a very short document, but take a look at what they want to control. Crypto asset offering, crypto asset exchanges, crypto asset lending and staking product, decentralized finance platforms, non-fungible tokens, and stable coins. Anything else? <laughs> you, you want to clean the bathrooms too? I mean, what? you know, this guy knows no bounds and... Again, I have to say just very quickly, I don't just I don't try to cover politics on this channel, but I will say with the recent political issues happening with the Supreme Court, I have to wonder if the Dems that are in control right now are concerned they're going to lose in November. And if they lose in November, they won't get the legislation they may desire from Congress. So maybe this opens the door for the U.S. Treasury, FSOC and OFAC to come in and write regulations in light of of possibly losing the power and the might of Congress. I don't know if that happens, but I think there is a window of opportunity for that path to be pursued. We'll see what happens, right? But here we see protected investors is not synonymous with filing enforcement actions. The Ripple XRP case has proven that the ones who get hurt are retail crypto holders. That's exactly right. You and me. And by the way, uh, Tom Emmer, Patrick McHenry, War, uh, not War, well, Warren Davidson did say some things, but I'm concerned about where, his, where it all lies with him. And we know Bill Hazinga have been very, very vocal yesterday, pushing back on Gary Gensler's doubling down to control jurisdictional power grab for crypto. And so has Hester Peirce here. And shout out to her and her courage. This was really her responding to the SEC post about doubling the size of enforcement for crypto. Hester Peirce herself says the SEC is a regulatory agency with an enforcement division, not an enforcement agency. Why are we leading with enforcement in crypto? Well, it may be the catalyst, potentially, for the U.S. Treasury to step in with FSOC and OFAC to sort all this out because Congress can't get it done. Again, there's Bill Hazinga and, like I said, Tom Emmer, Patrick McHenry, all been extremely vocal about what's going on with the SEC there. The SEC should, in fact, double the size of its ethics division. You want to increase enforcement, enforce criminal conflict laws within your own agency. That would protect investors a hell of a lot more than preventing them from collecting 9% from BlockFi, Celsius, and Nexo. So well said. Are we not? I mean, I'm telling you, and I am so grateful that John Deaton is representing now 67,000 of us. If you have not signed up for that class action lawsuit, what are you waiting for? There is no downside here. Look right here. We got another guy carrying the torch out here. It's Dr. Martin Heisboik. It is the head of Uphold Blockchain Research and or Blockchain Crypto Research. Yes, Dr. Martin Heisboik says here, you can defame it, sue it, mock it, and trash it, but it doesn't matter. XRP and the XRP ledger are booming. Come on in. This guy's getting a trophy and a seat with a window view. Come on in. Yeah. Let's get him a corner office with a window up there and uphold. Yeah. Here's the SEC news you need to know about right here, ladies and gentlemen, in the latest in the case. 
The court has granted Ripple defendants' requests for an extension of time to respond to the SEC's claim that Hinman documents are protected by attorney-client privilege. The response is due by May 13th. Well, check this out. And shout out to you, Jim, for everything you do, and Jeremy Hogan, too, and John Deaton and everyone else involved in the legal analysis, Bill Belisarius and Fred Rispoli. We appreciate each and every one of you. He says, finally... I feel like Ripple has taken the gloves off and is talking about how ridiculous the SEC's litigation tactics surrounding the Hinman emails are. The judge may still allow the sir reply, but at least Ripple is calling out the delay tactic strongly. This is basically on the heels of understanding that Matthew Solomon comes out swinging in the opposition of the SEC request to to file a reply brief The SEC requests leave a file to what they term a reply, but this would be at least the SEC's sixth filing in opposition to defendants' motion to compel. Let's take a look at that very quickly first here. And this is it right here. He said, we write on behalf of Brad Garling House, Christian Larson, and Ripple Labs to oppose the SEC's request and additional brief and support is assertion in the internal documents related to a speech given by the former SEC official protected from disclosure by attorney-client privilege. It goes on. I want to go back now to the highlights that Jeremy has given us here. The SEC requests leave to file what they term a reply brief, brief. Uh, but in fact, this would be at least the SEC six filing in opposition to defendants' August 10, 2021 motion to compel. It is therefore at best a sir reply, the SEC's request to such a sir reply, unsupported by any justification, and before even seeing defendants' response to their latest filing is both inappropriate and premature. It says here, uh, file a sir reply where plaintiff filed or failed to show good cause and failed to establish that defendants raised a new issue for the first time on reply as the decision to grant a sir reply is left to sound discretion of the court. Since defendants filed this motion to compel nearly nine months ago, The court has twice overruled the SEC improper deliberative process privilege objections, notwithstanding and the close of fact and expert discovery. The SEC continues to withhold all documents related to a former SEC official's June 14, 2018 speech for which he privately gained from. The SEC now claims, in effect, that the last year of briefing oral argument, the court's decision and their motion for reconsideration were all an academic exercise because it turns out that the documents, every single one of them, are actually privileged attorney-client communications. I tell you, you know, this this tells you just how much and how hard they will work to make sure that we never, ever see those those emails. This is the kind of gymnastics, the embarrassment. They do not embarrass very easily, obviously, at the SEC because they are doing it daily almost. Bill Belisarius tells us, he says, I don't accept the view that the agitation of the attorney-client privilege by the SEC now is reconsideration of the reconsideration. He says that is incorrect and basically goes on to say through the thread that there have been different moments and different segments of attorney-client privilege that have been addressed. And this final path here should address what is now current and embody everything that is in question is basically what he's getting at there. And then I show you this. Where are we with the timeline and what does all of this update and motions and filing and replies and sir replies do to the timeline? Well, John Deaton says it best here because Charles Gasparino says Ripple CEO believes SEC lawsuit could be resolved this year. However, John Deaton does temper that and says that's an optimistic view, but it's not impossible. Absent a settlement, absent a settlement, no one should expect a ruling before the end of the year. As Brad Garlinghouse said, it's not impossible, but extremely unlikely. So we want to keep that in mind. But as we keep that in mind, I also want to keep in mind this. Ripple's not leaving the United States, so it ain't going to be but so bad whether we got to wait till 2023 or whether we get a settlement or a summary judgment or however it goes. Ripple feels like it's going to come out on top because they just got another building 
in San Francisco. That's going to do it for me. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. I'm accumulating, ladies and gentlemen. That's not financial advice. It's just my digital perspectives. I'll catch all of you on the next one.